Hello. Right, I'll get started. Um, my name is Ian, and I am an accessibility specialist. So I work with various areas of the industry to try and raise awareness and raise the bar for inclusion of people with disabilities in game development. So for me, at the moment, it's a very exciting time in the development of the industry. Every year, the pace of change accelerates. More and more really nice stuff happens in the field of accessibility. Now, so I'm going to share with you today a few of the interesting things that have been happening. And doing this talk actually puts me in an interesting position. Because this time last year, I did a similar kind of talk about the highlights of what happened in 2015. And it was a pretty simple process. I looked at what happened, I put it into a talk, I gave it. This year, I can't do that because there's way too much to physically be able to fit into a presentation, which is a pretty nice situation to be in. So I'm just going to talk about um, four kind of common themes that there have been in the development of the industry this year. But first of all, because I'm sure there'll be a range of um, levels of expertise and knowledge about accessibility, I'm just going to assume nothing and start from the start with an explanation about what accessibility is and why it's important. And as I said, when I talk about accessibility, I'm talking about relating to disability. So, sorry? Someone say something? I assume not. Cool, OK, right. So I'm going to start with an explanation about what disability is. And for that, I have this gentleman here to help me. Now, this image was taken as part of an investigation that he was doing for a newspaper back in the UK. And I'm sure when looking at this picture, most of the people in this room would be able to have some kind of a guess at what this guy's disability is, what it is that's making him disabled. So you might be thinking that perhaps he has cerebral palsy. In which case, you're kind of halfway there. He does have cerebral palsy, but cerebral palsy is not actually a disability. It's a medical condition. And that's a really important distinction to make. So what else could it be then? You might also be thinking about the fact that he is in a wheelchair. But again, a wheelchair is not a disability. It's like a pair of glasses. It's a piece of assistive technology that actually helps him go about his day. And he was going about his day fine until he went to meet his friends in this bar and encountered the steps. So in the context of meeting his friends in this bar, he is being disabled by the steps. And that's what disability actually is. It's when someone's medical condition encounters some kind of barrier resulting in difficulty performing a day-to-day -day task. So it's a mismatch between a person and their environment. And the barriers that people face, whether it is steps in front of a bar, whether it is a shelf that's too high, whether it is red and green teams in a death match, these barriers are often put there by another person. So we're designed to be like that which is kind of a heavy thing to get your head around, that as designers, as developers, as content producers, we are actually contributing to people's disability. But there is also the flip side to that, which is by being aware of the kind of barriers that people can encounter, we can figure out which of those barriers are unnecessary and avoid them and remove them and prevent disabling situations like these from occurring. And it's that process that's known as accessibility. And accessibility is important. It's important for many, many reasons. But one of those reasons is that people with disabilities are a market, and not an insignificant market either. The latest US government data is 22% of the adult population of the USA. Now, not everyone in that 22% is going to encounter barriers with games. But that's more than balanced out by the other conditions that aren't included in that 22%. There's also color blindness, which affects 8% of males. Simulation sickness, estimates of that range anything from 10% upwards. Difficulty reading, now this is the one that surprises people because you don't hear about it because there's such a stigma. But difficulty reading affects 14% of adults. And this is just talking about permanent conditions. There's also temporary impairments, like having a broken arm, like RSI. There's also situational impairments, like having to play a game on mute because the baby's asleep playing in direct sunlight. So there's all kinds of situations where these kind of barriers occur. 
large, large numbers of people. And also these large numbers equate into large amounts of business, money to be made, money to be lost through these kind of decisions. And the other really, really important reason for considering accessibility is something that's a bit less mercenary. It's the human benefit of accessibility. Because what games actually represent is access to recreation, to culture, to socializing, which are things that so many of us just take for granted. But if for any reason in your day-to-day -day life, your means of accessing those things is restricted, games can then provide them and become a really important contributor to someone's quality of life. Or to explain all of that in a much more concise way than I have, it's one of my favorite quotes. So because accessibility is so important, it's been really, really nice to see the field advancing, more and more progress being made every year, increasing exponentially. Every year, you see more and more and more, faster and faster, and the last year is no exception. But going back a little bit further, the big advance of 2015 was the introduction of accessibility functionality on consoles, on both the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. And this includes stuff like text-to-speech, so that people who are blind can navigate the system interface, high contrast mode, zoom, remapping the controls at system level, all this stuff was added in. And that's continued on into 2016. You know, so neither company's been resting on their laurels, they've continued to add in more functionality, like control over tech speed, improved tech size options. Um, this is another nice example. This is the addition of um, clubs onto Xbox One. And you can see here it's being used by deaf gamers to find other people to play with who aren't going to kick them out of a game because they can't use a microphone. And it hasn't just been the consoles either, it's now starting to spread further. So this is uh, Steam Big Picture Mode, which now allows, again, full button remapping. And also Steam have open sourced the Lighthouse technology, which opens the door to custom input devices for VR. But this button remapping stuff, um, remapping at platform level, both in Steam and on the consoles, is really good as a safety net, but it's not as good as remapping in a game. If you have actual in-game remapping, that opens up things like being able to have separate maps for walking and for driving, or like in Overwatch, being able to have separate mappings for each character class. It also allows you to do things like have your in-game tutorials and prompts update to reflect what the current mapping is. But there is a barrier to that, which is the cost to implement it which is in the process of being broken down. So I think it was around April 2016, Unity announced that they're working on a new input model, which it hasn't hit general public release yet, but they're developing it collaboratively with developers, so you can actually already go on the site and download it and have a play around with it. And the basic principle is it just abstracts out inputs and actions by default. So an input being, for example, the A button, an action being jump. They're separate. And to create a control scheme, a developer just creates relationships, creates links between those things, which means the functionality is already there for players to do the same thing. And basically because um, Unity want to support um, input devices that haven't even been invented yet, you know, the scale, the pace at which things are being invented for VR and stuff like that, they want to make sure that all different types of input work together, which means that it can do things like, for example, remap, a controller-based control scheme to a keyboard or a mouse. You can remap analog to digital, so you can move a command between like the B button and pushing forward on an analog stick. So this is all quite difficult stuff for developers to do, and it's all just going to be handled for you at engine level. And there's also been some nice platform level um, advances outside of the dedicated gaming space. So what you're looking at here is an iPad on the right, and the iPad is being operated solely by the yellow button. And that yellow button is something that's known as an accessibility switch. And it's called a switch because it's a simple on-off interaction. And those kind of input devices, they can take lots of different forms. It could be a button like that. A common setup is a button mounted on a wheelchair headrest. It could be a tube you blow into. 
It could be an infrared link detector. It's the same kind of kit that Stephen Hawking uses to operate technology. And iOS is compatible with this. Like at, at an operating system level, you can operate the whole of an iPhone, of an iPad, just using a simple in, single input. And it has a couple of different modes. One of them is basically it works like um, shooting in a basketball game. So you have a line that moves across the screen. Sorry, wrong one. So you have a line that moves left and right across the screen. When it reaches the coordinate you want, you make your input, it stops. Then the line moves up and down. You choose the coordinate you want. Once you've chosen a coordinate on the screen, it pops up a little menu and asks you what you would like to do at that point whether you want to tap, whether you want to swipe, whether you want to zoom. Which already makes a lot of games accessible. So you can imagine a basic interface type game like Football Manager, something like that. You can operate using this technology. So like this guy's doing, Christopher, he's using a single button on his wheelchair headrest. Not so good if you're playing something like Flappy Birds, for example. So Flappy Birds, in theory, it is just a single input. It should work with this kind of technology. But using this scanning from side to side system, you can imagine you move across, move down, hit the start button, starts moving across, and that's happened. That has now changed. This has been really, really exciting to see. In the past year, um, Apple, in response to requests, has actually done two specific updates to this functionality, specific to games. So the first one being in iOS 9, they added the ability to choose a point on the screen and then tap repeatedly at that point, which means that games like Cannabolt, games like Flappy Birds, now just work with that kind of technology. iOS 10, they upgraded it again, allowing you to hold down at a point repeatedly, which means games like Alto's Adventure, games like Badlands, just work with this kind of technology, which is a really, really amazing example of the power of operating systems to facilitate this kind of stuff. Because it just means thousands of games overnight now just work with this kind of technology without any effort from developers at all. There's also been advances in games themselves. Now, in the games media this year, there's been two things above all else that have really, really dominated the media. The first one being Pokemon Go. And Pokemon Go is actually accessible with this kind of switch technology that I'm talking about. So what you can see on the screen here is after you've chosen the coordinate, it gives you the little menu, the palette of actions you can choose. So you can see here is choosing a flick to flick the Pokeball. But despite this, Pokemon in general is not a very accessible game. Now some of that is due to the physicality of the game, the fact that you have to be you know, climbing up hills and stuff to play it. But a lot of it is actually just due to simple uh, interface decisions. So things like these complex gestures. That it has small, low contrast text, which is obviously not great for a game that you're supposed to play outdoors in the sunlight. Also, the map screen. There are elements on the map screen that are distinguished by color alone. Not so great if you're colorblind. So this obviously isn't an advance. It certainly doesn't make Pokemon Go unique. What does make Pokemon unique, Go unique is stuff like this the huge, huge amount of discussion that there's been about it. So blog posts, social media, right, even like mainstream media articles about it. From gamers, from developers, from advocacy groups, people like American Foundation for the Blind, groups that are not normally involved in gaming who are now talking about the accessibility potentials of Pokemon Go. Lots of people with loads of really good ideas about how to improve the accessibility. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's important because it's a real real sign of the growing awareness of accessibility. And also people's changing expectations about accessibility as well. You know, gamers have got different ideas now compared to a couple of years ago about what games should be, about what games should be doing. And it's also really significant because it's a big sign of the cultural significance of games. Because there's a really, really strong undercurrent to all this commentary of people who, you know, they could see this cultural phenomenon happening around them, and they didn't want to be excluded from it. They wanted to experience the same thing that all their friends were experiencing. Now, the other thing that's been dominating, obviously, the games press and also the mainstream press over the last year has been VR. And VR can be quite an exclusionary 
platform. So the requirements to be able to walk around a room, the requirements to be able to use two hand-controlled motion tracking controllers. Even just the simple function of putting a large bulky object onto your head, all these things can be exclusionary. And some of, these, some of the barriers that VR um, throws up are kind of inherent to the platform. There's not much you can do about them, but a lot of them can actually be addressed through just good accessible design. Which people are realizing. There's a lot of developers who are really, really passionate about accessibility in VR, and they're doing some really, really nice things, really nice creative approaches to accessibility in VR. And this is really, really exciting for me to see because we haven't had this before with a new platform. We didn't have this when motion controls came out. Before that, we didn't have this when touch controls came out. So it's really, really exciting to see just this kind of level of understanding and appreciation of accessibility at such an early stage of VR. And we also had the launch of PlayStation VR, where the vast majority of launch games had an option like this. We have a choice between a standard controller and motion controllers, which is obviously handy if you don't happen to own move controllers. Also really, really handy if you don't happen to have a full set of working arms and working fingers. So hopefully because this is also PlayStation VR, it's obviously quite a high profile launch, a lot of high profile games. Hopefully this will be the kind of thing that can help set a precedent, show other developers what's possible. Another nice really source of accessibility in games over the past year in particular has been through game jams. I was just having a chat with someone just before I came in about this. Now, I'm sure most of the people in the room are pretty familiar with game jams, but just in case there are some uninitiated, it's basically like a game-based hackathon event. You turn up on day one, get given some kind of a challenge, team up, and then have a very, very short amount of time to build a game. And one of the biggest ones is an event called Global Game Jam. This is a photo of just one single venue of Global Game Jam. There's venues like this all over the world, loads of different countries, you know, like 10,000 participants, tens of thousands of participants. And Global Game Jam is an organization that cares a lot about accessibility. They have a, um, in addition to the main theme, they also have a set of optional challenges. You know, for in case building a game in 48 hours wasn't enough of a challenge already. And every year, a number of those optional challenges are accessibility ones. So for example, in 2016, they had challenges like make a game that you can play using one hand, making a game that has high contrast visuals. And those challenges were taken up in the region of 3,000 times. Based on the average team sizes in Global Game Jam, that's something in the region of 10,000 developers who were experimenting with accessibility over the course of this weekend. And Global Game Jam don't have a monopoly on this either. In the past year, there's been more accessibility jams than there ever has been before. Jams that are either dedicated solely to accessibility, like this one in Japan, jams that have an accessibility element, like Global Game Jam. There's been, as well as this Japan, Global Game Jam, there's been ones in Poland, UK, Canada, global ones. And it's really, really nice to see because game jams are such a powerful tool for erasing awareness because there's a really common misconception that accessibility is gonna be difficult, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be expensive. But if developers can come to an event like this and see that actually even in the context of building a game in 48 hours, you can make a real difference, that's a really, really powerful lesson that people can take back to their day jobs. We've also seen some nice progress on individual features. One of these is subtitling. Now, subtitling is really, really important for lots of reasons. I mean, the obvious one being if you're deaf. It's also important if, like I said earlier, if you have to play on mute because the baby's asleep. It's also important if you're playing in a noisy room. People have it turned on because audio mixes and games are unpredictable. There might be an explosion going off, just an important bit of exposition. So because of all these reasons, it's not really surprising to see data like this. Now, I have to give a little bit of a disclaimer because this isn't you know, a scientific study. This is a straw poll on a website, but still, it starts to tell a bit of a story. 
So because subtitles are so important for so many people, they're obviously worth doing a good job of. But nobody does. Subtitles in games are terrible, and I do mean in all of your games. And this isn't coming from me. So this is just coming from a single thread on NeoGAF. So you can get the gist right. So in general, gamers are really not happy about the state of subtitles in games. And it's really, really simple things. You, know, you can see a lot of things people are talking about here are just the subtitles are too small. I can't see them against the background. This really isn't rocket science to solve. And it's also problems that have already been solved by other industries, you know, like TV, film. They've been looking at this stuff for 50 years. They figured it out. You can just copy the lessons they've already learned. And games, finally, are starting to do that. So a few examples. This is from a game called Virginia, which doesn't actually have any dialogue in it at all. But it still has captions for important background sounds. The latest Tomb Raider game. So you can see here it's using color to distinguish who is speaking. It's also using name tags to distinguish who is speaking. It's also using letterboxing, which is the name for that rectangle behind the text to increase the contrast. There are games that have done this before, but what makes Tomb Raider unique is that it's optional. So there are some people who really, really rely on this kind of stuff. Other people who find it distracting. Just give them the option, turn it on and off. We've also started to see games giving this option, the option to configure the size of the subtitles. And again, this comes down to the different kind of use cases for subtitles. Because, you know, some people, if someone's deaf and needs to understand every single word that's in the subtitles, they need it to be as clear as possible. Somebody else, like the person I mentioned, who just glances at them occasionally when an explosion goes off, they want them to be subtle. So, again, just give people the choice. Someone else who's done this recently. This is um, the latest Hitman game. Two nice things here. First of all, it's giving a preview of what the subtitles are going to look like. Secondly, subtitle size 46, which is an important number. So that's 46 pixels at 1080p. That's the size that your subtitle should be. If you only have one size for your subtitles, make them at least 46 pixels. If you don't want them to be that by default, at least provide an option for people to be able to change them up to that size. Last example, this is from Life is Strange. So you can see they also have a size option on here. Underneath, they have an option for the letterboxing, that black rectangle behind it. You can turn it on and off, you can change the opacity. What you're also looking at is a list of all the games that have ever implemented this. So this is standard functionality on other platforms. You look at YouTube, you look at Netflix, they've got these kind of options. This is the only game to have done it, and it's such a simple thing to do. So if you want to really be at the pinnacle of innovation in the games industry, let people turn that black box on and off. You'll make a lot of people happy. So this is just kind of the start. As I mentioned, there's, there's all kinds of other things you can do, lessons you can learn from these other platforms, these other industries. So if you take a note of this link here, this tells you all these kind of things you can do. So onto another feature that we've seen a lot of progress in um, is color blindness. That's continuing its march on towards being a standard consideration. In the past year, there's been a lot of progress in the number of games considering it, also progress in the type of games that are considering it. So this is a game called Hue, which is a color-based platform puzzler. So you can see there's a ring around the character. When you choose a color from that ring, it changes the background to that color. So if you were to choose purple, the background would change to purple. Those purple blocks would no longer be visible against the background, and you can walk past them. So entirely color-based game. This is the kind of game that you know, a year or two ago would have been written off as being fundamentally about color. How can someone who's colorblind possibly play that? They've added symbols. Really simple, elegant solution, and it works for all the different types of colorblindness. And they've had really, really good reception from the community for it. The next game I'm going to show you is a similar kind of thing. It's a similar color-based um, color puzzle game. This one's first-person one. 
but it's based on colour mixing. So in the next game, if you wanted to choose orange like this, you would actually have to choose yellow and red and mix them together. Again, this is the kind of thing that a couple of years ago would have been written off as impossible. It's inherently colour based, right? So they've just done this. So again, this is a similar kind of solution to what was used in Hue. They're just using symbols. So if you want to make something orange, you just combine the symbols for yellow and the symbols for red, and that gives you orange. Really nice, elegant solution. And again, something that's gone down really, really well with the community. As well as these features, there's been all kinds of nice examples of individual games doing other nice things. Way too many to be able to go through today, but I'll just give you a few quick examples. This one is Madden 17, which has a whole suite of options for impaired vision. And there's actually a talk about this on tomorrow afternoon, if you want to find out more about this. This is Warlock of Firetop Mountain, and this has a lot of options for configuring the typography. And this is designed specifically for that 14% of people who have difficulty reading, which is so rarely considered, and a lot of really quick, easy fixes you can do. Overwatch. Now, Overwatch is a bit of a mixed bag. There's some things Overwatch doesn't do so well, but some things it does really, really well. And this is one of them. So this is what I was talking about earlier with being able to um, remap all the individual classes individually. That makes this kind of stuff possible. It makes a real difference. And this is the really, really important example of a game for the last year. So you might have seen some of the press about this. This is Uncharted 4. And Uncharted 4 has um, put in some effort into accessibility for motor impairment. So it has features to allow you to play one-handed. It moves the camera around automatically for you. It has functionality like Grand Theft Auto to automatically lock on your own. It has an option here, the one that's highlighted for repeated button presses. So if you can't physically mash the buttons, you can just hold it down instead. And these options are really popular. This is something you quite often find in accessibility is because what you're doing is just removing a barrier, you aren't addressing a small niche, you're making the game better for everybody. Because what's a complete game stopping barrier for one person, it's probably still a bit of annoyance for everybody else. So they actually found that the um, camera assist for playing one-handed, that's actually used by a third of their players. They also had some really nice accidental accessibility as well. So if you play the Uncharted, you probably know they have um, a whole bunch of modes you can unlock, which are just intended as a bit of fun. That includes a slow motion mode and a slow motion aiming mode, which is really, really helpful for people who've got impaired motor ability. It also includes this, which is something called Thief Vision. As you can see what it's doing with the contrast, with the edge detection, this is actually unintentionally making the game accessible to people who are legally blind. So that means people who aren't completely blind, but have a low enough vision that has a significant impact on their, uh, on their lives, they can still play just based on this accidental feature. All this stuff is really nice, but it isn't the real reason why Uncharted is important. The reason why the accessibility in Uncharted is important is because it's in Uncharted. So going back to what I was saying earlier about misconceptions, another common misconception is that thinking about accessibility is going to make your game less fun. It's going to dilute down your ideas to suit a lowest common denominator. It doesn't take very long looking at Uncharted's critical reception, its Metacritic, its sales figures, to see that that is completely false. And the other reason it's really important is because being such a high profile game, it makes other developers sit up and take notice. And there's historical precedent for that as well, because, you know, I was saying color blindness, I'm sure you're all aware color blindness is a pretty common thing to consider now. In 2014, it wasn't. It was really, really rare. And it wasn't until three games in 2014, which is Borderlands 2, SimCity, and Black Ops 2, they implemented color blind modes. It was big, big news, like front page news. And as soon as that happens, people knew about color blindness, other people started implementing it. And we're already seeing this with Uncharted. Everything from one man indies to the big publishers are actually taking notice and thinking a lot more about accessibility as a direct result of this game.
and it isn't by accident either. They made a lot of effort to actually tell people about their accessibility functionality. And they aren't the only people to be doing it either. So down at the other end of the scale, this is an indie game called Legacy of the Elder Star. And what this is, is screenshots from the trailer from the game. So they've dedicated the whole chunk of their trailer just to telling people about their accessibility features. Which kind of seems like an obvious thing to do, tell people about your accessibility features, but a lot of developers don't. And that's, you know, that's the worst situation you can be in. If you've dedicated time and energy and money into putting this stuff into place, and gamers don't find it. So really, really important to tell people about what you've done. It doesn't have to be through fancy videos either. It can be other means, such as in Final Fantasy. This is something I've never seen before. So in Final Fantasy XV, they've actually included accessibility information in the printed manual. But it doesn't need to be as fancy as that either. This is going back to Hue, that color-based platform game. They included one single bullet point about their colorblind mode in their press release. As a result, something in the region of 20 different outlets picked up on the colorblind mode, gave it a really, really good reception. And he actually gave a talk about it on Monday, and he reckons it actually pushed up his Metacritic score by a few points, just from including that one bullet point in this press release. So it's nice for getting some good PR from as well. And game developers aren't the only people who are telling gamers about accessibility functionality. This year, game critics started including this kind of information in their reviews. Game critics is a mainstream game review site. And as of this year, on every single review they put out, they include information on colorblindness, controls, and hearing accessibility. And on this topic of dialogue, dialogue is a two-way thing, right? So it's not just about you giving information to gamers about accessibility. It's about you getting information from gamers about accessibility as well. And this is a really nice example of that. So this was earlier last year. Um, Karen Stevens is the person who's giving the talk about the Madden accessibility. She's actually set up an email address and a Twitter account specifically for receiving accessibility feedback. And she then routes that to all the various different EA studios. There's been explicit calls for feedback as well. So this is a survey that went out from Fail Better Games, asking for input from the community on ideas of how to make the games more accessible. This is the same thing again from Cliff Blazinski. And this is actually following on from an experience that Cliff had earlier in the year that he wrote about. So this is from a, a meeting that he had with a group of young veterans. So Cliff there. Cliff um, isn't the only example of high level support and recognition for accessibility that's been happening. This recognition goes all the way to the very top. So in the past year, Able Gamers, which is an accessibility charity in the USA, were invited to speak about accessibility at the White House. Special Effect, who are an accessibility charity in the UK. Their new facility was opened not just by the Prime Minister, but by a delegation of senior politicians from across the political divide. And there was all kinds of nice quotes that came out of this. Um, this is one of them. It's probably not gonna mean a huge amount to you if you're not from the UK. To understand it, basically replace uh, Mr. Cameron for Mr. Trump and Tom Watson for Bernie Sanders. So you can see in the UK, this is kind of a big deal. This kind of real, real high level support and backing and understanding of the importance of accessibility. But back in the games industry, there's been this kind of high level support as well. So at E3 last year, um, there was the Gaming for Everyone initiative announced by Microsoft. And this is kind of a general inclusivity, inclus inclusivity and diversity initiative, but explicitly includes accessibility for gamers with disabilities. And this is a quote from Phil Spencer, head of Xbox, about that. So this kind of statement 
about the importance of accessibility. You know, a couple of years ago, this just would have been unimaginable. Another quote here from uh, Phil Spencer as well. So just to explain exactly what this is, this is the head of Xbox praising a PlayStation exclusive game. This is not something that happens every day. And PlayStation themselves as well. At PlayStation Experience, which is their annual consumer event, they hosted a panel specifically on accessibility. This isn't something that's happened before. And this is a quote from Sean Layden, chair of Sony Worldwide Studios, from the start of that event. So you can see, we really want to be leaders in this field. This kind of high-level support and backing for accessibility isn't something that there's really been before. And it's so important. Because over the years, speaking to developers on the ground who really, really want to do nice stuff, implement nice features, but they just haven't been able to because they can't get it up the chain, up onto the backlog, because management, you know, don't leave any ROI, all that kind of stuff. You need that stuff. If you want to enact lasting cultural change, it has to come from multiple angles. You need to have people on the ground who understand what's required, who want to do the work. You have to have people at the top who believe in it, who are willing to empower their staff to make those changes. And you also need to have pressure externally. So you need to have the public, the gamers, letting industry know that this is important, this is something that they want to see. And now, for the first time, we're actually starting to see all those three pieces start to slot into place. So that means that now, like never before, we have a real opportunity to enact lasting positive change to the industry. We just have to reach out and take it. Thanks. So as I said, this was just covering kind of a few key themes. Um, the first link on there is a much longer version. It's basically all the nice stuff that happened over the last year and the quotes as well. Um, the next link down, game advocacy. If you want to get involved in kind of bringing these advances about, that's lots of ideas of things you can do to help push the field forward. Then lastly, game accessibility guidelines. If you want to implement accessibility features into your own games, that gives you loads of good suggestions of things you can do, examples of good practices, stuff like that. And lastly, me. Um, I'm always keen to chat. If there's anything you ever want to know about accessibility, anything you want to chat through, anything you want to rant about, get in touch. I'll happily talk your ear off. So that's me. Um, we've got a bit of time. If anyone's got any questions, I'm more than happy. If there's anything you're uncomfortable asking now, just hit me up afterwards and we can have a chat. Any takers? Anyone going to start me off? So, question for you. You, uh, you held up Unity's action map as maybe an example of a way that a middleware provider can make it easier for game developers to build accessibility in their games. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about other opportunities the platform holders or the middleware vendors have that could um, make it easy to do some of the other things that you talked about today? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this is the potential for things like middleware to, to make it easier for developers to do this kind of stuff. There's huge, huge possibilities there. Because historically, engines have been a blocker to accessibility. They really could be an enabler. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the uh, remapping is a really good example. Another one is subtitling. Because a lot of the things that are talking about, those good practices, they could be addressed at an engine level. Because often the problems you get are because of the way that subtitles fit into the production pipeline. You, don't get, you can't actually produce the subtitles themselves until you have the audio. You don't get the finalized audio until the end. People then build a system without any time and any resources, and it's just kind of a bit hacky. Um, if it was done at an engine level, you would get developers who would get to that point, say, oh my god, the engine does it for me. I'll put it into my game. I'll just use that. Amazing. If what is built by the engine at the engine level has all these nice good practices built in, that means that those developers, even those developers who quickly chuck it in a rush, have got all that really nice accessibility functionality in there from the start. So just the things like the, the ability to customize the letterboxing, like having a decent default size, all that kind of stuff could be nicely handled at engine level and stop people having to reinvent the wheel every time. 
especially when they're reinventing the wheel as a square every time as well. Um, yeah, that's one example. One that I'd really, really love to see some progress on is um, screen readers. So that's the um, technology that people who are blind use to access technology. Um, so basically, it just reads out text strings or whatever on the screen, whatever is on the screen. Um, it works really nicely on mobile devices. Um, so this is on any mobile devices you've got, whether it's um, Android, iOS, Windows Phone. Um, you just turn on the screen reader, and it changes how gestures work. So anything that you would normally do with um, two fingers, sorry, with one finger, you have to use two fingers for instead. That frees up one finger, so you can run your finger over the surface of the screen, and through synthesized speech, it speaks out the label of anything your finger moves over. So you can actually use your finger like an eye and visualize what's on the screen. So stuff like interface-based games is really perfectly suited for. It doesn't work with engines, because engines don't output native um, operating system interface elements. They output just a bunch of pixels. That's something that engine developers could address. And if they did, it would make a huge, huge difference. And I don't know, if I, if I can steal Evelyn's thunder? Yep, sure. So um, there's a talk tomorrow um, by um, Evelyn Thomas. Um, is she also tied as a program manager? Evelyn's program manager. On yeah, Xbox. program manager for accessibility at Xbox. In her talk tomorrow, she's going to be talking about um, a new API on the Xbox that allows developers to access text to speech. So game developers can actually make their interfaces blind accessible on the Xbox. That's the kind of thing that could be done at engine level, you know? Because all the engines have decent UI systems built in. If they automatically passed out like, the labels of those interface elements, then there'd be a lot of interface-based games that would just be blind accessible by default with no effort from developers, which is how it works with natively built games. It'd be amazing to see engine-based games doing that as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, really good question. There's, there's a lot of potential for good from, from middleware engines. Any other takers? No, we're good. Good stuff. Thank you.